As Illinois approaches its bicentennial celebration, the Illinois Channel takes a look at the people, events, and landmarks that make up Illinois' rich history. Next, from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield, we hear from historian Mark DePew and hear audio clips of those he's interviewed about the troubled times of the administration of Rod Blagojevich. Wow. Um, this is part of the tales from the vault. Well, I have nothing to show you from the vault. The other historians are the experts of that. My idea as a vault is the recordings we do and that we preserve and we post all of this. All of the material you're going to hear today is available on the internet. But over those years I've talked to lots of other people about Governor Blagojevich and there's a lot of interesting quotes that I've done. So I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Uh, we'll take a chronological approach through Governor Blagojevich's life and highlight some of the significant things, but it's purely a vehicle to be able to give, give me the opportunity to play some of these, some of my favorite clips that I've collected over the years, I have to be honest. Okay, Golden Glove Boxer. Uh, Rod Blagojevich was born on December 10th, 1956. He's older than I thought, in Chicago, Illinois. He was a Golden Glove Boxer. I think his record was something like six and one. So he did pretty well as a Golden Glove Boxer. Uh, most of you recognize the young lady in the right there. That's Patty Blagojevich High School photo, and that's her quote that she had from her high school years. She was born in 1965, so she's nine years younger than he is. Daughter of Alderman Dick Mel. And if you know anything about Illinois politics and Chicago politics, being an alderman in Chicago is a big thing. They wield a lot of power. Rod met Patty. I got it spelled wrong there, it's an I. In the early 1980s, well, she was still in high school. That's what I understand. And the first clip I'm gonna play is one by Bernie Siraki, Bernard Siraki. Hold your hand up, Bernie. <laughs> the author of A Just Cause, The Impeachment and Removal of Governor Rod Blagojevich. And I wanna preface this particular quote by saying this is he heard from only one person, so this quote never got in the book because he couldn't verify it from a couple of the different sources. I think as historians, that's important to recall. But it's a fun quote, as Bernie would readily testify. So if I may just digest the story that I wanted to put in the book, but I couldn't get collaborated by anybody, but I felt it was okay. But it was a, uh, a word which was filed the gentleman we did know, he was an alderman in Chicago. And uh, this individual who told me the story was sitting there at this fundraiser for Dick Mel. And, uh, and there's a whole bunch of people standing around. And he was with this other fellow. Uh, the other fellow, like, uh, we used to call him Fabio because he looked like Fabio the entertainer. Up comes this young attorney, Brad Blagojevich. And he says to these two gentlemen, he sees this young lady there. He said, Who is that? Who's that lady? And he said, That's the old woman's daughter. And the Blagojevich supposedly said, to him, That's my ticket to power. <laughs> Ah, he already had his eyes on the prize at that early age. So if I may just digress for a minute, the story that... I, I was afraid that would want to fight me on that. Okay, Blagojevich's early career, 1979, he graduates from Northwestern University, had just the last couple years there. In 83, he got his law degree out in California, the beaches of California. I think he probably spent more time on the beaches, but in the, the law library, but from Pepperdine University, he clerked for Alderman Ed Vidoliak. Those of you know who Chicago history will recognize that name. And then he was the assistant state's attorney for Cook County under state's attorney Richard M. Daly at the time, you know, Richard J. Daly's son. Obviously the future mayor of Chicago in his own right. 1992, he was elected 
to the Illinois House, and four years later in 1996, because suddenly this seat for the most powerful member of the U.S. Congress was vacant. Uh, that was shortly after Dan Rostenkowski was removed from office because of corruption reasons. And I think there was a Republican there for a very short time. And then it was Rob Blagojevich's turn to be the representative from that district, from the 5th District of Illinois. So that moves us up quickly, quickly to... Uh, Blagojevich, the campaigner, in 2002. This is his first run for governor in 2002. It is a good time for a Democrat to be running for governor. The Republicans had held the governor's seat since 1976 when Jim Thompson was elected. Thompson was there for 14 years. Edgar was there for eight years. And then George Ryan was there for four years. But most of you know that it ended badly for George Ryan. By the time he got to the end of his administration in 2002. Uh, the U.S. attorneys, he could hear the U.S. attorney's feet pounding behind him, ready to indict him soon. And that wasn't too long after Ryan was out of office. He indeed was indicted. So here you got a Democrat can run. It. The Republicans have been there forever. It's corruption is rampant in the state of Illinois. Elect me. His biggest challenge was in the Democratic primary. And he beat two important people, I think. Paul Vallis, who had a great reputation as the chief executive officer for the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, Vallis, by the way, is running for mayor here in this next election. And Roland Burris, a former attorney general for the Democratic Party. Rod won that race primarily because he won downstate. Uh, Vallis won easily in the Chicago area, and if Roland Burris hadn't pulled a lot of votes away from the black community especially, Vallis would have been the governor in 2002. And I maintain that Illinois history would be dramatically different if that was the case. But it was Rod Blagojevich's turn, a master politician. He railed against corruption during the general election, and he had an easy target with George Ryan. And he also had the advantage of the confusion that the general public would have is, wait a minute, Jack Ryan is the Republican candidate. I thought we just got rid of a Ryan. What's the deal there? Well, there's no relation between George and Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan, excuse me, Jim Ryan. Jack, that's a whole different story. We don't want to go into that one. Jim Ryan. Um, there's no relation between the two. He was the attorney general at the time. But Blagojevich won a relatively easy victory, 55% of the vote. And my second clip here is Taylor Pensano, who at the time I think was in the Illinois Coal Association, but he'd also started writing books about Illinois history, especially political figures and gangsters, as Southern Illinois, I should mention. But he had an opportunity to meet with Blagojevich on the campaign trail. So he came in the room, and uh, first time I'd ever uh, met him. Uh, you know, how you doing? Good to see you. So, so we sat down. Now that was the day that he had been in Springfield the whole day, and that was the day that uh, he had had a press conference, assumably in the State House, somewhere in Springfield. I thought the State House, whereby whatever he wanted to talk about the press conference. It was completely submerged, overshadowed by the fact that there was a disclosure that he had smoked marijuana. And he got hit with this that day. And the whole news story that day was nothing to do with what he wanted to talk about in the press conference. It was on him having smoked marijuana and did he inhale and okay, and all this stuff. All right. So I was aware of this. Okay, so this is this has been his day prior to this. So he comes in the room, he sits down on this table. And he looks at me, I'm sitting here, just like you and I are. We said nothing outside of, nice to meet you. He looks at me, I look at him, and his first words to me were, do you want to smoke some marijuana? <laughs> it broke up the room. <laughs> and I was, I was stunned. I'd never met him before. And then he laughed. He said, we might as well do it. I'm getting blamed for it anyway. <laughs> That's how it started. So okay. he came in the room. 
He's elected in 2002 with 55% of the vote. He is governor now. But right from the beginning, the relationship with the legislature, probably the most important relationship any governor is going to have, is a rocky one. And he also has a deteriorating relationship with Illinois Press. Yet, he wins in 2006 as well. Judy Bartopinka, the treasurer at the time, was his candidate in that year. Um, at one time, she was leading in the polls, but that was probably about a year before the election itself. By the time of the election, he had enough money and he swamped the, uh, the campaign with money and his energy that he typically had in, on the campaign trail. He won, but this time only 49.8%. So, okay, well, that's less than 50. There is a third party candidate, I think a Green Party candidate that polled in the neighborhood of 10%. And Topinka was well down. He was ahead of her by a wide margin. So he is reelected in 2006. A little bit about his work habits then. And if you all remember reading the newspapers, none of this is going to be news to you. He preferred Chicago to Springfield. He made a, one of the first issues, at least for Springfield, was that he wasn't going to live in the mansion. Well, I think folks up in Chicago uh, yawned and that kind of a news story. But that was a big thing here in Springfield. He had a reputation for being perpetually late to everything. And it was well earned because he was late to just about everything. He enjoyed exercising, as you can see here, a Chicago Cubs fan. He was a huge um, sports fanatic, as we'll get to in a little bit. He was much more interested in campaigning. He was superb at that. And in fundraising. He was even better at fundraising than he was in the day-to-day -day work of the governor. Now, normally I wouldn't want to make that kind of statement, but that was generally regarded by almost anybody who knew him. That was the reputation that he had earned. I thought I'd play next then this quote from Governor Jim Thompson, which is illustrative of the kind of approach he did take to the job of being governor. When uh, Honda was trying to decide between Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois to put their new factory, Honda hired me to put together the, the case for Illinois. And that required me to work closely with the Bogoyevich administration marshalling the resources of the state, the Department of Economic Opportunity and the universities and everything, local government, labor, everything you would marshal together to support Illinois' request for the factory. And we worked well together. I, I got to say, in that instance, the Blagojevich administration went all out to get that plant. They did it in the right way. Uh, and nothing I asked for was ever denied. There was one unfortunate meeting with the governor where I had these Honda executives for a meeting with the governor in the governor's office in Chicago. And uh, we waited. The governor's running late. Governor's running late. The uh, re-election was going on. And he comes whizzing into the room. And before he says anything to the Japanese dignitaries from Honda, he said, Jim, Jim, I just came from my debate, and she thinks I ought to be in jail. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I thought the Japanese guys were going to go, oh, wow. Our first meeting with the governor from Illinois, <laughs> and he wants our plant, and the first thing he does walk into the room is talk about how his opponent had said he ought to be in jail. But then, then after he sat down and got all put together, every time the Japanese asked him a question, he'd get this terrified look in his face and look to me, you know, and I'd have to answer it. And he'd say, yes, that's right, Jim, you're right, Jim. So that's Blagojevich in the job. When Imaging. His image was always important to him. And most of the people I talked to described him as being a very likable guy and charismatic. In fact, Dave Luchteberg, Luchtefeld, who you're going to hear a quote from him pretty soon, said he was the best polit politician, the best campaigner he'd ever met. Well, I chalked that up to the fact that Dave Luchtefeld didn't get to Illinois politics until after 
Jim Thompson was out of office. Uh, Jim Thompson was just a superb campaigner. He had the ability to connect. But Blagojevich was right behind there in that respect. Uh, he fashioned himself of being this huge Elvis fan and would dress up and sing Elvis tunes and things like that. A flashy dresser. He had uh, an expensive taste. He spent tons of money on suits and ties especially. And most of you might remember his big hair, how much pride he took in the hair, and having the comb with him at all times. In fact, the, the joke among his staffers was, who's got the football? The football. Like, you know, the nuclear football that the president carried. Well, in Blagojevich's case, it was the comb. Had to have the comb there. He did have presidential aspirations. Not unusual. Um, today, we would think that's almost laughable, but that was he was serious about it at the time. And here is my second quote from uh, Bernie Siraki. He would come into political events with this entourage of people around him. And uh, I've seen him come into a political event. They would line up like, like a prize fighter goes into a ring and all his handlers are have their hands on each other's shoulder in the line and are kind of going in the rock, 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 rock. And then the fighter would come in boxing, you know, shadow boxing. But Goyevich would do that. He would, that's how he entered political events, shadow boxing. And with his handlers going rock, rock, rock. I mean, this was, it was an unbelievable show. And uh, <laughs> we may never have to live with your life <laughs> <laughs> okay. He would come into. As I already mentioned, his relationship with Illinois legislatures started off kind of rocky and got worse very, very quickly. He had very poor relations with Speaker Mike Madigan and the House Democrats in general. Uh, first time that, that Madigan felt like he had broken a deal, had lied to the Speaker. Uh, things went south very quickly after that. He had considerably better relations with uh, Senate President Emil Jones at the time and the Senate Democrats in general. And a lot of people chalked it up to the rivalry between Madigan, who had always been considered the best politician in the state of Illinois, and Emil Jones, who, for whatever reason, maybe jealousy or something else, wanted to have an opportunity to, to stretch his own power a little bit. So, uh, Olgoyevich did a little bit better in the Senate, but he had a hard row to hoe when it came to the House and didn't get much done because of that. Now, the next quote here, I had talked about Senator Dave Luchtefeld from Oakville, way south of Illinois, who spent most of his life as a teacher and a very, very successful basketball coach. And then when he retired from teaching, he became a Illinois state senator, a Republican. And you see him here with his very good friend on the left, Frank Watson. And Watson was the guy who essentially recruited him to run. Here's, this one's a pretty long clip, so I beg your indulgence. I cut it down as much as I could, but it's, again, it really illustrates the kind of guy that, that uh, Blagojevich was. One day I'm in Frank's office, and uh, it's about six o'clock. The phone rings, and I hear Frank say, hello, Rod. He says, Rod, why don't you come up for a beer? Now we're on the third floor. He's on second. He'd be right there. So he comes bouncing in by himself. And, and wherever he went, it was, hey, God, it's good to see you guys. Man, it's good. You are two of my favorite people. In fact, you might be my favorite senator. And Frank goes, stop all the bullshit. <laughs> and he just laughed. You know, it was just, it was just, just laughed. So we got to talking about the Cardinals and, and uh, the Cubs and, you know, and so, and Frank is, a, Frank is a really knowledgeable sports guy. I mean, Frank's really good at names. And so we get to talking about the Cubs and the Cardinals. We got to into Lou Brock. You might not know this, but he came from the Cubs. And anyway, Frank said to him, 
who'd the Cubs get? Huh. Now, I knew the main guy, Ernie Barilio. But there were two or three other minor leaguers that Bob Ivish went boom, boom, boom of who they were. And so we got to talking about things like the old St. Louis Hawks, but they were a professional. They were in the NBA. And uh, I was in college at the time at St. Louis University, so so they used to they used to come to St. Louis to the up to the university to work out. And their best player was a guy named Bob Pettit. Probably not heard that name, but and and uh, Cliff Hagen were the two stars. Well, I mean, the guy knew, and he's a young guy now. He 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 don't he wasn't probably alive when they were there. He knew the starting five. Then he says, "How about this? The spirits? Now you, you probably don't know this, but when the Hawks left St. Louis, there there was a, shortly after that some." rich guy put together a another pro league called the American Basketball League, I believe. But but it was another to compete with the NBA. And they set up franchises in different cities. One of the cities was St. Louis. And set their name was the Spirits. So they played in St. Louis for as long as the league lasted. It finally consolidated with the NBA. ABA. American Basketball Association. So anyway, guess what? He knew the starting five on the Spirits team. I mean, the guy was just brilliant on sports trivia. I bet we talked for an hour and a half. And people like Feldman, the, the, the Patty Shu, who is the was the sports director of the, uh, and she still is the uh, press secretary press the person for a Frank. She comes in the room. When she walked in the room, hey, Patty, I just love you. <laughs> you know, it just went on and on and on. Yeah, it was an interesting hour and a half. And all of a sudden, he goes, oh, I got to go, I got to go. Frank said, what do you think he wanted? He called me, and he wanted to come up here and talk to me about something. What do you think he wanted? I have no idea. Neither one of us had any idea what he wanted. He just took off. So that's the kind of guy he was. Now, I actually cut that one down quite a bit. He had lots of other examples where Blagojevich had this incredible memory about sports trivia, of all things. Um, but I thought that was yeah, I mean, indicative of the kind of guy that he was. More on the relationship with the legislators. In this case, it's going to be a, cl a couple clips from Frank Watson, who was in that room again that you heard with, uh, with Dave Luchtefeld as well. Check out the t-shirts. These guys collect t-shirts over the years. Well, if you remember, there was this period of time when there was annual budget fights, extended sessions, over and over and over again, then that, that Blagojevich would get upset with the legislature and to force the hand, he would have a special session. So they'd all come to town. Well, of course, in many cases, he didn't bother to show up for the special sessions, but over and over and over again. That's a, that's a way to convince the legislature to do what you want. So that's worth this 04 attorney at Camp Blago pout. And then the budget. What budget? Because there is an annual budget fight as well. So here's two clips from Frank Watson. And this, these are both about a trip that Blagojevich made to Greenville, another small southern Illinois town. I don't know if I told you this about the capital program when he came to Greenville. He wanted to talk to me about the capital program and what we could do to move it forward. And he said, I'll fly down to Greenville. And he did. And we met him out at the airport. Here he had his entourage of vehicles out there waiting for him when he came in on a plane and got off. That was a big buzz out there. There, Oh, my gosh, the governor's coming in. <laughs> so hey, we're, we're out there. And Dave Lichtefeld and I, and then the governor and, and Jay Hoffman, and, and we get in his vehicle. And I wanted to take the governor around Greenville and just show him, show him the sights. I mean, there's not a whole lot to see in Greenville. You've been there. But anyway, I wanted to, I wanted to show him our industrial park. And uh, I wanted to show him what our new high school that we built in 1957. <laughs> that was our new high school. And, and then I was going to take, I took him by the old high school. 
which was our junior high, and it was condemned then later after that. And we proceeded up College Avenue, is where we stopped, met the, gov the uh, president of the college, Jim Anoya, when we talked with him, and the governor made him feel good. And we drive on up, and we stop right on the square, four-way stop, and a guy walks across the street, a guy too. And I told him, I said, you know, you see that guy over there? And he was had an oxygen tank. He was carrying an oxygen tank. I mean, he, he, he's had his health issue. And he's walking all across the street. I said, that guy won the lottery. He won about, I don't know, two hundred dollars $300,000. So I just put, and I said, you know, he's a Democrat too, by the way. The governor stopped the car. We stopped. He got out of the car. He goes up and just starts shaking hands and everything and with these people. And we're holding up traffic, if you can imagine, traffic in Greenville is a, <laughs> isn't a major problem. But there was traffic behind us. And anyway, he's talking to them. And we're, we're in the car still. And... He comes back in. Oh, thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. You know, I said, well, what about? He said, well, I think, I think I'm going to get a donation out of those people. <laughs> I mean, and, and that was and truly, that was where he, I mean, he excelled in raising money. And, and Okay. Shortly after that, they started to drive east out of town, and that's where this, this excerpt picks up. Then we went by another prison, and I told him, I said, Governor, this is a prison. You cannot close. And because he tried to close Vandalia, the state prison. Well, he said, why is that? I said, well, this is a federal prison. And so he asked me, he says, Frank, do they have a workout room in, in there? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, do they have weights? And I said, yeah, they, they've got a weight room and they've got weights outside and in summer they have them all. He said, well, you know, you never know. I may end up out here. <laughs> he said that. Dave Lichtenfeld and I just kind of looked at each other and just, well, you grew to expect the, anything to come out of the mouth of the governor. I think you can see why it's so much fun for me to have the opportunity to talk to these guys. And what an opportunity. Then we went by another I I prison. I told him, I said, Governor, this okay. is a prison. Capital program. I don't know what that's, why it's doing that. Hopefully this is the next, or the next slide I've got. You might recall that one of the big fights dealt with the pension shortfall. How long have we been arguing about the pension shortfall in Illinois? For as long as I can remember. In 2003, believe it or not, it was $42 billion, which seemed to be insurmountable at the time. What is it now? Like $130 billion or isn't it going? Anyway, he had this annual budget fight that I already alluded to before. But in 2004, not just Governor Blagojevich, but the legislature decided to borrow $10 billion, and the bulk of that was going to be funneled back into the pension system to fix it. So they did fix it and improved it from 49% to 61%. In other words, 61%, you're getting to the point where it's a little bit healthier and sustainable in the long term. But then the legislature, and, and eagerly supported by Governor Blagojevich at the time, decided to only do half payments for years 2006 and 2007. I bet there's a few pensioners in the room right now who take this stuff seriously. Well, that just kind of reversed this whole good, that whatever good might have come from uh, borrowing the $10 billion. And of course, the state of Illinois still has to pay back that $10 billion as well. So it just deepens the hole in that respect. But that's what he did in that case. And almost from the very beginning, there were rumors of corruption. Now, I'm sure most of you remember U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Patrick Fitzgerald. Did he have any other scalps on his belt already by this time? He had George Ryan's scalp on his belt. He was the guy who indicted and then eventually were able to convict George Ryan. He also was the one involved with the Scooter Libby investigation, if that name rings a bell for most of us. Now he's after Rod Blagojevich, almost from the first day. You're hearing all these rumors. Now, mind you, Rod Blagojevich is the guy who ran and was elected because he was running against the corruption of George Ryan. There were rumors of pay-to-play schemes, of hiring scandals. Much of it dealt with his fundraising techniques, if you want to use that term, techniques. 
corruption in the teachers' retirement system, and on and on and on. There was lots of rumors in Springfield and Chicago as well thrive on rumors, political rumors like this. Allegations of abuse of executive power, uh, things like the flu vaccine, some of this is going to ring a bell to you folks, uh, purchasing drugs from Canada to get discount rates, all of the things that are circumventing federal law and things like that, uh, spending money that the legislature had never actually authorized. So there is a litany of things that were suspect. And this next quote is from our own state senator at the time, Larry Bompke. I was so frustrated, like most members, in May, I believe it was May, and it's in that book, um, of 2006, that I sent a letter to the Speaker of the House asking him to start the impeachment process. I, I asked that the impeachment process be started. And I sent a letter to the Speaker, gave a copy to the media, I guess, and one of the, um, the individuals who's now Chief of Staff, Phil Drays, who I have the utmost respect for, who's, who's a staffer, was a staffer for uh, the, the Republican Senate, called me up and said, congratulations, Senator. You've just uh, recused yourself from voting if this becomes, <laughs> if he gets to the Senate to be impeached. And he said, this is a trial. And by putting out there that he needs to be impeached, you've already said how you're going to vote. And he could have you removed from voting and have you recused because you've already said it how you'd vote. So I spent the next six months saying, look, I don't know if he's, it's impeachable what he did or not. I just said I think the process should be started. We need to look into it. Okay. It was in 2008, after another brutal budget fight, didn't get all the money he wanted, um, he decided to go after a few state agencies, uh, insisting that they downsize to be able to save a little bit of money and get closer to a balanced budget. And he targeted three agencies, state agencies at the time, state parks, part of the Department of Natural Resources, obviously, Department of Children and Family Services, and the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency, which this institution at the time used to be part of. Now you can ask, why those three agencies? Uh, politicians typically do this kind of thing because they know that there will be a public outcry if they do that. That, that will give them some leverage in negotiating with the legislature again on, on budget issues. But nothing came of it except that there was talk for practically half a year. Uh, I remember it well, all the discussions in the IHPA and here in the Presidential Library and Museum. What's the impact going to be? What's the impact going to be? It finally went into effect on December 1st um, for all three of those. And what that implied then was the people who were union members, who were in particular positions, if you were a senior, if you'd been around for a long time, you had the opportunity to bump some, you know, they decided, the agencies decided which positions they were going to remove. And then the people who had been in those positions who might have had a lot of seniority had the opportunity to bump somebody who had much less seniority. So on December 1st, 2008, 30 AHPA employees lost their jobs. There was all this moving around back and forth, so the ripple effect was much bigger than that. And also, 13 historic sites closed, including the Dana Thomas House, one of the jewels of the system. So here's the impact of that particular fight. And that's kind of close to home here. I mean, I don't know that it got that much attention statewide, but it certainly got attention here in Springfield. And people who were attached to these state parks, like Kickapoo State Park up here, certainly took, took all of that seriously. And then on December 9th, we woke up to the news that Governor Blagojevich had been arrested in his home up in Chicago. 
And the big charge, as I'm sure almost everybody in the room remembers, was that he was attempting to sell President-elect Obama's Senate seat. And I think it was that one especially that caused Fitzgerald to move much more quickly. Typically, they would let this play out, but this is real time. We got, we've got to do something to prevent the governor from selling that Senate seat. Now, here's a quote from Dave Blanchett. Many of you will remember him as the longtime public information officer for the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency. And here's his reaction when he got the news. It's one of my favorite quotes. December 8th is the date that Governor Blagojevich arrested. December 9th, I got it wrong. I don't remember exactly where I was, what I was doing. I was coming down um, Madison, no, yeah, Madison, because that's one way. We were going to the parking garage at the museum, and I was a couple of blocks away from the parking garage. I had the news radio on, and the story broke right when I was coming down Madison Street, and I almost ran away. <laughs> and and I was and, and the light was red and I was sitting there and just you know turned the radio off. I'm like, am I hearing this? Am I hearing this? And the cars you know, they pull up beside me. It's rush hour. You can tell they were doing the same thing. And all of a sudden the horns start honking. <laughs> and the people you know, their windows are shut because it's winter, but I can see people going, yeah, yeah, and horns are honking and. <laughs> I, I pulled in the parking garage and I couldn't even make it into the building. Like, have you heard? Have you heard? You know, the, the security people and the people who are coming to work at the museum. Like, guys, 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 you got to find out exactly what's going on. This this impacts us directly. You know, what do we we need to know? What we're going to do. Uh, but it, it was one of those surreal moments in my state service. Were you as elated as most of the other people you were seeing around you about this? Hell yes, I didn't like him at all. <laughs> because? Uh, I had seen him behind the scenes, and what a ruthless, cutthroat, vulgar, mean, vindictive person that he was. I couldn't stand the man. I couldn't stand what he had done to people I was close to. I couldn't stand what he had done to this great agency. And uh, it, it didn't come a moment too soon. I like it when the people I interview don't pull any punches. <laughs> and Dave didn't pull any punches. Well, that leads then to the impeachment just one month later. And I would certainly recommend to take a look at the impeachment of and removal of Governor Rod Blagojevich, which my friend Bernie Soraki wrote. And he and I are in agreement on this. Can you think of a more important political event in Illinois' 200-year history than the impeachment and removal of Governor Rod Blagojevich? And it happened in our lifetimes. Some of you might disagree, but to me, that's right at the top of the list. Uh, he was in, impeached for abuse of power, for maladministration and malfeasance. That's the kind of thing that the public would yawn at. But the legislators took very seriously because he was he was taking some of their power away from him. It was that balance of power thing. That was what was going on here, a struggle and balance of power. The thing that caught the public's attention, of course, was the selling of President Obama's Senate seat. And, you know, other things like the demand for contribution uh, to help out the children's medical hospital, things like that. That was the typical kind of stuff he was doing in, in terms of raising funds for his campaign. Then it goes to the Illinois Senate. I should have said there was one vote not to impeach. And Bernie, who was that? You recall? Oh, his, his sister-in-law sister voted not to impeach. It went to the Senate. January 29th, guilty verdict of 59 to 0. Now, we, before we started, I asked Bernie to come up, and uh, I heard his Come on up here, Bernie. I asked, I asked him about one of his favorite stories, which is the moment when Andy Menard, Senator Menard, or was he a staffer at the time? Chief of Staff. Chief of Staff Menard goes to get Blagojevich. He hadn't appeared at all in the House. This is the one and only time he's going to appear before the Senate. And Bernie, you got two minutes. Now, you told me I'd had six minutes. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Actually, I told him he took six or eight minutes to tell the story when we recorded the interview. Right. Uh, is, this, uh, is this working? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, Frankly, they didn't know if Bogoyevich would come to Springfield at all on the last day because he had no representation in the, in the trial at all in the Senate. Now, he had an attorney or two attorneys in, in the gallery, and they would call him at night and, uh, and tell him what went on, but they made no statements. There was no plea. The, the Senate took that as a not guilty plea and, and proceeded from there. So uh, the, day, the night before, uh, his attorney, one of the attorneys, a fellow named Clayton Harris, had asked, uh, wanted to have a meeting with uh, John Cullerton and, uh, and a few staff people and a few other senators, and that he had notified them that Bogoyevich wanted to make a, uh, a, a statement the next day. And they said, okay, we'll, get, we'll grant him leave to make a statement because he had not taken part in the trial. So he wasn't part of the trial now. When they called for who's, you know, for, for the governor in the beginning day, in the first day, he did not answer. So they thought, well, we'll grant him leave. That way, we can stop him if he starts going absolutely crazy. Basically, that was it. So uh, he was supposed to come the next day, the final day. And uh, uh, Andy Menar, who was chief of staff for a couple days up until that point, uh, didn't even, didn't think he was going to come. But he called the Department of Aviation and they said, yes, a plane has taken off and the governor was on it and it was going to Springfield. So we knew that much. Trial starts for the final day. The, uh, uh, come to the point where David Ellis, the prosecutor, uh, makes his final point. And now the governor was going to make a speech to the Senate. By the way, he part of the agreement was he wouldn't be under oath. So he could say anything. And so uh, it's time to go now. Now, no one knows in the, in the Senate, nobody knows where the governor is. And there's silence. I was there. There's absolute silence when David Ellis finished giving his remarks. And John Cullerton, Senate President, said to staff member Andy Menard, all right, go get it. So when I walked out the back of the Senate into the hallway, down the back hallway stairs, stairs that go down to the second floor, opens the door, the governor's suite, the governor's floor on the second floor is absolutely empty. There's not a secretary, there's not staff people. It could have been Sunday afternoon. And he's walking around, nobody is around. Finally gets to the front, and there's some gentleman sitting at the front desk, and the gentleman says, what do you want? Who are you? And he said, I'm, I'm Andy Menard, and I come to get the governor. He's, he's got to go upstairs. All right, so takes him back to a room that's paneled. It's a conference room in the governor's suite. And he says, wait here. Now, Andy had just been there looking for people before, so he goes back. To now, he's sitting there looking at his watch, because everybody is in the, up in the Senate, the galleries are packed, but there's not a, it's like right now, there's not a sound in the Senate chamber from the gallery, people, nobody talking on the phone, nobody walking around, just nothing. And Andy says, I've got to get this guy, because it's Justice Fitzgerald, who was the presiding judge, is very punctual. And, uh, so he's sitting there about five minutes, ten minutes. Oh my God! What, what you know? What am I going to do? I go back to the Senate and say, I, you know. Just then, Rod Bogoyevich comes, and I, I use the word bopping. It's a Chicago term, but he's bopping down the hallway, and he sees Andy in the room, and he says, "Andy, what are you doing here?" And he says, "I come to get you, Governor. We, we've got to go upstairs." He said, "Go upstairs for what?" And then it kind of dawned on him. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, well, come on. Come on in the office. So he goes, takes him into the governor's office and starts talking. And just then, an entourage of people, Mark was going to go a little longer than it. It already and is. <laughs> this entourage of people come in, and they're all talking and laughing. And uh, they start joking around. And Andy says, governor, we've got to go. So the governor says, 
Okay, um, give me a few, few seconds. So he goes into the bathroom. If you've ever been in the governor's office, there's a washroom right across, right across there. Goes in there, and again, and now we figure he was combing his hair, but he's in there for 10 minutes. And the group is, you know, joking and laughing, and the, the entourage is there. Just then, the door slams open. He kicked it open, but I, I can't say that because I didn't, I didn't see him kick it. The slams open, and the governor runs out of the door and runs to the back stairway. And the whole entourage, including Andy, start running after him. And he starts running up the steps. And uh, just before they get to the third floor, and by the way, when I wrote this from the book, I said, Andy, come and take a walk with me. By then it was Senator Menard. I said, uh, now tell me exactly where we were and what happened. So this, this is true. This is true. Andy got to the governor just before they got to the third floor. And he says, Governor, Governor, wait a minute. I've got, you know, wanted to tell you where to go and what to, what to do. And by the way, these people can't come, they can't come on the floor. And he says, oh, whoa. He says, well, she can. And he points to this lady. And he says, she can. This is personal. So Andy's thinking, oh, God, you know, i got to get him out there. OK, OK, she can. So they start walking up the steps again, and he looks down, and he sees a press pass on this woman. And he, Andy is thinking, oh, my, if I allow her to get on the floor for whoever she's with, by the way, it was a lady from uh, the New York Times, uh, and I don't allow anybody else, they're going to kill John Cullerton in the press. I can't do this. So he says, no, 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 wait a minute, Governor, she can't. <clears throat> so they have a big argument again. And I remember standing on the, in, the, uh, in the stairwell with Andy and hearing the voices, our voices echo and can bounce off the, off the, uh, the uh, facilities. And so I, I can kind of imagine what it was. Finally, uh, Bogoyevich says, all right, he relented. The woman will not go on the floor. And so they get to the third floor and walk in the back of the Senate now. This is in the back. And all the press starts yelling out, Governor, what about this? What about that? And he gets to the first door going into the Senate. There, and if you've ever been into the back of the Senate, there, there's like a little corridor. And there's a door to the hallway, and then there's a door to the Senate. And you can close both doors, and you're in this little confined area. Bogoyevich and Menard get in the area, and Andy shuts the door and walks, and he puts his hand on the door that's going to open him up to this open up to the Senate. And the governor grabs him, grabs his, grabs his forearm, and he says, Andy, Andy, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I'm innocent. And Senator Menard, Andy Menard then said, you don't have to convince me, he's pointing to himself, you have to convince those 59 people out there. And with that, he opened the door. The boy which started to go out, and he started to come out like this. <laughs> and then he didn't. And he gave a, what was basically, and I'll stop here, uh, a political speech, but it was a marvelous, marvelous speech. And that's, that's what I can remember. Today. So 59 to 0. And of course, every senator has a chance to make remarks. Then he's out of office. Pat Quinn becomes the new governor. Now it's time for the real trial, the federal trial. And uh, this is something I learned from my interview with Bernie. He decides, and his lawyers, he went through a couple crops of lawyers, but the lawyers that he ended up with decided they could win the race just by getting him as much attention as he possibly could. And I don't think. Blagojevich had a problem at all in, in taking that particular approach. So here he is with David Letterman. Here he is with Larry King and Diane Sawyer. Good morning, America. He even went on with the ladies of The View. I, I hadn't seen any of these. I'm sure some of you saw some of this. Many of you will certainly remember when Patty decided to help out by appearing on, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. You know, she was eating bugs and things like that as part of the trials. And of course, the last picture I've got here, on Celebrity Apprentice. 
and I can't remember the name of the host at that time. You guys might be able to recall that name. So there he was, getting lots of publicity. Time for the trial itself. He's indicted on April 9th of 2009, so about three months after he's uh, impeached and uh, taken out of office. Uh, there is tons of evidence that's presented against him by the U.S. Attorney at the time. The defense presents no witnesses whatsoever, but the, the uh, verdict comes in on August of 2010. He is convicted on only one of the 23 charges. Excuse me, one charge, and it's a hung jury in 23 charges. So you might think, well, maybe the strategy he had kind of worked in his behalf. It was a hung jury. Well, they weren't going to stop at that. A missed trial was declared. It goes back for trial again. And it wasn't until June 27th of 2011 that the second jury comes in. He's found guilty on 20 of the remaining counts, um, not guilty on one. And they, for whatever reason, they decided not to take any action at all on two. So 20 counts. The conviction then. Once he gets the conviction, it's 14 years. And it's interesting, most of the people I have interviewed, both Republican and Democrat, thought that was an excessive amount of time. It's almost universal in that respect. Now that came down on December 11th of 2011. And that means he's prison bound. March 15th. Of course, this is the scene right before he goes to prison, right outside his home in Chicago, and he's still this celebrity, almost as if he's still campaigning in that respect. And I think almost everybody knows now he's spending the next few years in the Federal Corrections Institute in Eaglewood, Colorado. His identity now is not Governor Blagojevich, it's inmate 40892-424. And if you call the prison, that's, what the, that's how they'll refer to them. They don't have any kind of titles. They're just another inmate as far as they're concerned. All of the appeal attempts have failed. Uh, his last appeal is to get a pardon from our current president. We'll see how that works. And since obviously they had something of a relationship when he was on Apprentice, uh, Celebrity Apprentice, um, but it was interesting to me that all of the Republicans came out when there was some discussion about that, making a point that he does not deserve to be pardoned and released early. Obviously, Patty and the girls feel very strongly the other way about it. Uh, if he serves out his normal term, 85% of the, uh, the actual conviction, then he'd be released somewhere around 2024. So he's still got a ways to go before he is released. And one last comment. This one is from Gene Callahan, the ultimate party Democrat as far as I'm concerned. He was Alan Dixon's chief of staff for many years, one of those guys who knew everybody and if, you know, through a period of, of time he had developed those kind of relationships. He was proud of the fact. He made this a real distinct point. He had a bumper sticker, in fact, something to the point. The second time around in 2006, here's the ultimate Democrat party guy, did not vote for Blagojevich. That's how strongly he felt. And here's the comment that he made when I asked him about his views. And this was obviously in an interview prior to the time when he was convicted. I think we will suffer for at least a generation. I think that he's hurt, he's, uh, he's hurt us so much. If you go on vacation, people will ask you about him. You know, and that he did all that weird stuff on TV later. So pe people know who he is, and, uh, and he's, he's a disgrace uh, to our state. He's a disgrace to his family. Uh, and uh, that he ought to go to jail. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I guess we have time for a few questions, and I might defer some of these to a guy who knows much more about his life and career, uh, Bernie here, but if you do have questions, I'd be glad to field them. Is there something about the way the city works that just doesn't translate to the way you have to administer the state? 
boy, I don't know that I want to touch that one. <laughs> um, I guess here's a comment that I would make. Both Richard J. and Richard M. Daley had time in the state legislature. And Richard J. especially lived this very honorable, pristine life, didn't do the womenizing that were going on at the time, and was very insistent that anybody who dealt with didn't do the same thing, and then goes back to Chicago. And as far as they're concerned, you know, Chicago politics and being an alderman and being the mayor, you know, their minds, that's a much more important, that's a bigger thing than being in state government. Uh, beyond that, I don't know if I want to handle that question. You know, I, I haven't dealt with a lot of Chicago politicians. Jim Thompson is the big exception. Uh, Don Clark Nets as well. So the more I'm thinking about it, there's plenty of exceptions to your generalization, I would think. Is that a cop out? I don't know. Mark, have you tried to interview uh, Rod LaGuardia? I have not. Um, I oftentimes get the question, I'd have to go out to Colorado to do it. I think I might be retired before he's out of prison. I wouldn't necessarily object to doing it, but how much truth would we get from the man? You would get his version of reality. That would be certainly revealing, I would think. And like I think I alluded to, wouldn't it be an interesting request to go across the governor's desk? This guy wants to go out to Colorado to interview Governor Blagojevich. Are we, you know, do we want to spend money on that? So, uh, I, when I was writing the book, I, I uh, talked to a fellow that uh, who's from the University of Illinois at the time, and his name is Andy Morris, and he is not because he was a witness during the trial, and uh, or excuse me, during the impeachment hearings, and uh, and the trial, and. Uh, he said to me, are you going to interview Bogoyevich? And I said, no, nah, I don't think so, because all he's going to do, if, if he agrees to it, is tell me how innocent he is. And he said, well, you have a better book if you interview Bogoyevich. So I, uh, I had a contact with a good friend of Patty Bogoyevich's. And I said to my contact, this is what, see what the reaction would be if, uh, if I said, I'd, and I'll go out to Colorado and, you know. And uh, she came back to me with an with a answer that there are a couple of reasons he won't. First of all, he doesn't see visitors, be, or many visitors, because he's got to be strip searched, and he doesn't like that. Uh, second thing is that his hair is now white, and he doesn't like people to see him with white hair. and. Uh, so he'd rather, so I just, I left it, and that was, that was as far as it okay. went. But that's. I think the part that maybe a couple of you didn't hear, he doesn't like to be strip searched. So who would? Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, does the library have copies of these memorandums of understanding between Blagojevich and the legislature? And do you know if that process was discontinued and it was just particular to the Blagojevich? Administration. Memorandum of understanding between the governor's office and the legislature. Well, when the legislature, when uh, especially Madigan uh, cited that he couldn't trust Bogoyevich's word anymore. Any official government documents would end up in the state archives. And I don't know if either of my historians back here want to chime in on that one or not, but uh, those are the kind of documents that are generated by one of the state agencies and they would end up in the archives. So I don't know the answer to your question except for that. Anything else? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Illinois Channel. You may also wish to follow us online where you are free to make comments or program suggestions. Get our breaking news updates on Twitter where you can find us at Illinois Channel. You can find our past programming on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Illinois Channel TV. Or you can go to the Illinois Channel website at illinoischannel.org. There you can find not only our current video stories and programs, but also our library of past programs, as well as articles that provide additional information about Illinois issues and individuals. 
the Illinois Channel, keeping you connected to your state, your issues, your home.